and uh, all the speeches were absolutely brilliant and very different, uh, de dealing with very different topics and very different aspects of it. And I really had to write down many things I did not know and uh, many things that made me think in a new way. Uh, and it was also different. So the first thing I have to do is I have to ask you uh, to maybe give some immediate reactions because we didn't have uh, almost any possibility to ask questions to each other, to um, articulate disagreements, and there might be disagreements or there might be uh, reactions. And I know uh, already we already met yesterday. I know that you all have that sort of very interesting immediate reactions. Uh, we have to postpone them to this moment. So I would be very glad to hear first reactions and comments first. And we'll start from there. Should I have a question to the last um, sharing? Um, and then can you continue to ask the question? Uh, actually, you could, yeah, are there indigenous uh, singing hello? Uh, can the indigenous, uh, can they mostly um, self-sustain like throughout daily life you should, uh, how does it work do they also rely on yeah, the other in the yeah, resources I mean, the, the situation i mean there's indigenous people in the city who work as whatever there are um, indigenous people in the region where i live who work uh, as a barman and uh, there are communities in the amazon i mean there are what they call uncontacted communities which is also very self-centered western because they haven't been contacted by us so they are uncontacted but they may be in contact with something else um, there are many different types of communities there are some that you know have a living very similar to what they used to have which is you know it's, i mean it's interesting i mean the yanomami the yanomami are super yanomami are more or less famous no because david Kopenawa went to the un and went to in the 80s and the yanomami even though it's a territory that is occupied that is invaded often by gold Gold, gold diggers, gold, you know, people who look for gold, the, the Amazon has got a lot of gold. Um, they, and they were, many of them were killed by diseases in the 80s and 90s. They still have a life which is very similar to what they used to have, some of them. Um, fishing and, and uh, they interestingly spend 35 to 40 percent of the time working only uh, in the day, which is like the other of the awake, awake time. I mean, they have different ways of going around things, but there's also people who are, you know, actually, I mean, doing the, all the things that n normal people would do there. Um, so it really depends on what, how the community was affected by the presence of non-indigenous people next to it. Um, yeah. And I ask because um, I'm also thinking about the last question from Lo uh, Lolo C. Um, yeah, if we don't want this kind of decolonization, then what else can we do? So, so, but then maybe some kind of small community that can self-sustain okay. is another uh, way out, which is also going back to the anarchy. I think mean, yeah, Simon also mentioned in the end. And, yeah, so just wonder how yeah. all of you think about it. What's interesting that you think you're talking uh, what's interesting, even as we're talking about sort of like self um, sustaining, sort of like self organized, sort of like community, so if there, whether it's that. Uh, okay, I have to be very close. So, whether if there are sort of like small self sustaining or self organized sort of communities, either in indigenous form or in for sort of like forms that exist in sort of like urban spaces. Uh, what I'm curious is the sort of like claims to, I guess, competing sort of like forms of universalism that many of these sort of like communities make, right? And whether these are still actually sort of like viable tactics. Uh, I, I want to hear sort of like more from you. Uh, Lolo C, of course, suggests that this idea of Tina is another sort of like form of competing sort of like form of universalism. But as you were saying that you have other sort of like model could it exist in this day and age where you know the economic order is so global and singular? Uh, so this was a critique that came primarily from, say, an academic like, I don't know, someone like uh, Peng Chia from Berkeley. 
he has sort of made certain sort of claims that are against Mignolo kind of like idealism, right? So I was wondering in your sort of like case study or in your sort of like experiences, do you see this as a viable alternative? I think it's really fucked up of an academic in Harvard saying what is possible for these people to do or not when these people are doing it. It's, it seems really strange to say, no, your fight is useless. Your struggle is, I mean, just give up when I have a salary from, a, you know, tenure. It, it just seems so strange. Um, you know, Mexico, for example, I haven't talked about Mexico, but Mexico, there are communities, it's not just Chiapas. I mean, Chiapas was like a kicking point, and now right there, like, like, they're like self-determined communities of 50,000 people with their own guns who kicked out the, 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 the cartels and kicked out the government. And they have a assembly, um, you know, direct democracy structures, and they have the forest, they have the cultivation, they have the culture, and it's working. And they have like, these communities have 15 years, and nobody dares to enter because they're so, you come in there and then they suit you. And this is this is happening, and this is working for them. I mean, whether it can happen at a, in, I mean, global scale, it's not interesting to also export the Mexican system to Vietnam. Why would you do that? Also? Could I, could um, I just yeah. quickly ask? Sure. Uh, small question. Who keeps their sort of like hierarchies in check then? Does it come from within the community or are there outside sort of like checks and balances? I'm curious in these instances. The hierarchies? Because, because within these communities they are not all egalitarian communities. No, no, no. no. Right. So how, um, do you, how do they sort of, how do you, how, what, what happens in, on the ground like, in your observation? But equality as, uh, is also, equality is an abstract thing. It's also like some kind of French construct, you know. Um, I mean, maybe. I mean, I mean, the thing you can go to a to a uh, Aymara place and say, "Oh, there's sexism here." But you, I mean, the, the relationship between women and women doesn't have to be the same as that that we fought for in the West because our working conditions and capitalism and industrial revolution demanded in urban context demanded for this type of constructions. Um, there's been there's also so, so super super uh, delicate case, for example. Um, those, some communities in Brazil um, don't allow the survival of children who are born with, with some physical problems, for example. And this has been like a fight, you know, because you know this is like killing children. It's, it's not allowed. But I mean, I mean, the basic response is that you know um, they don't let children starve, and we we do. I mean, we let children starve all the time, uh, and we actually made them go through things which also are super cruel. Uh, so, I mean, they have a way, I mean, each of them will have a way of dealing with certain issues that, I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's wrong to go there and say you shouldn't do it this way. The negotiations are happening within them, and some of them get alliances from people outside. I mean, but, you know, the, the, the women struggles are, I mean, right now, the, the leadership of the indigenous movement in Brazil is more visibly women than men. In the 80s, it was more men. And this is a change, and this change has happened, and it's super amazing. I mean, it, this change has happened, you know, and why? You know, because the women in the communities have decided that they wanted a different way of doing things. Cool, super, and su support it completely, you know? Um, but I mean, also, it's not about, you know, generalizing, it's about seeing these cases. But hierarchies, I mean, things that this, I mean, the, I mean this, we pretend that, you know, the liberal democracy, I mean, you know, Brazil would say that everybody has their own the same rights, but that doesn't mean anything. Because people are being killed and people are having no sewage, no health system, no electricity. I mean, what does it mean to be equal there? It doesn't mean anything. That the equality is, is, is false, you know. So hierarchies, we have them all, the hierarchies, you know. Income difference, I mean, the world is becoming less equal and the abstraction of the, the rights is, is, the abstract rights are basically maybe a facade or something else, you know. So I think that we can't just go there and say, you got, them wrong, you got it wrong, you have to do it the way we, we do it. That would be like insane, no? Sorry, I, um, I also have a question for Pablo. Um, um, when you were saying about um, the painted bodies um, were disliked by the colonizers. Sorry, okay. The painted bodies were disliked by the colonizers and that contribute, you know, constitu contribute partly to their negative self-image of some sort. Um, I'm, I'm, I want to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on that because um, 
I've read in some British missionary writings um, in the 18th century, um, when they were um, colonizing the Pacific Islands, they particularly wrote about the painted bodies, and these British missionary men were obsessed with them. They loved them. What they have a problem with is that how these painted men slept with each other, promiscuity, and men and women all the time. <laughs> That's what the missionaries have a problem with. But the paintedness, they actually felt that kind of is liberating um, to see how masculinity could be manifested in different ways. So I'm, I'm curious if that's a difference between Portuguese um, colonialism and British colonialism. So if you want to yeah, I was, uh, I mean, I was not so much talking about the painted body, but, but the, the color of the body. Uh, but, but also, you know, the, um, I mean, the Spanish and the Portuguese did it a bit differently, but, um, but at the same time, also it was the Jesuits who had a strong presence there, and the Jesuits um, tried to get rid of things, but they quite didn't manage at the time. So I mean, I mean, every, everything. I mean, it's hard to say what remained and what didn't remain. But uh, well, the Jesuits also was like not necessarily nation based. No, um, I mean the Jesuits did a lot of it, but I mean it was weird that the, the Jesuits were. Uh, an independent evangelization arm in, co in collaboration and in tension with the colonial power. I mean, they had agreements and disagreements, and, and they their own, you know, they, they gathered indigenous from place and then used them as slaves, and then also sometimes defended them from being killed. I mean, it's all that really complicated process. But um, yeah, I mean, in, in general, uh, there was this, this trying to kind of like get people to do and to live as we are. I mean, you know, the naked body is not okay. The naked body is to be covered. You know? uh, this is like you know, Christ, Catholics can deal with the naked body, um, and they succeeded much better in in, in, in the other countries in, in 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 Brazil. They didn't quite succeed with that. But also Portuguese uh, colonialism was a bit looser than, than Spanish, which is not mean better or worse. It just was a bit less less organized, less professional. You know? But uh, no, yeah, but they didn't like any of the things. You know? No, none of the practices were accepted as, they were like you know, practices that were, you know, recurring to different cosmologies, and these cosmologies were not cool. What is amazing is that they, they resist after 500 years. That's amazing, you know, the resistance is, is, is so super surprising. You know? Can I shift to China again? <laughs> I'm still stuck with this uh, Confucius Marxist. And uh, you know what? It's quite interesting because uh, in Thailand we have so many Chinese diaspora. And uh, if you hear lately in the last uh, 10 years that we have a lot of like many different type of demonstrations. And one is the yellow shirt movement, which is mainly uh, people mainly people who participated in this uh, yellow shirt movement, which is more uh, royalist and, and nationalist, they are Chinese diaspora, you know, from uh, mostly based in Bangkok, like Man Bangkok urban middle class. So I was kind of wondering, like maybe the ideas of Confucius you know, is still intact there because uh, there was one leader, you know, he's uh, Thai Chinese, you know, the way he said that we are grateful that we are here and because of the kings, you know, grant us to stay in this land. So we have to be grateful and kind of, uh, how do you call it, we, we, we have to be appreciated. Therefore, we are more, you know, they kind of practicing and performing the Thai-ness, you know, they are, they are more Thai than Thai people, you know, I, I would like to say that, which is really, uh, that's what, that's how they create this, uh, the words hyper-nationalist, you know, and hyper-royalist, and, and it's very interesting for me to observe that most of them are Chinese diaspora, you know, who are based in Thailand. So, the, uh, the, another question is, uh, I, I saw that, um, the like, since when, you know, that they, the, the, the Chinese government started to kind of adopt or even like reappropriate the Confucius in the Marxist policy. And the thing is, 
I, I saw in the news, like uh, the Prince of Thailand, Princess Siwinton, she went to China quite often, and she even like um, opened the Confucius Center at Jilalongkorn University in Bangkok. And I, I, I don't know what is the rationale behind you know, the Communist Party. Why did they start to kind of digging into the, the ideas of the regime that the, the, the Bao Zedong already like, you know, uh, eradicated you know, during the Cultural Revolution? And why, what is the reason why they retrieve it back? Um, well, it may not be more than 10 years. Uh, I think, uh, I, I now forgot the, the exact years. Uh, but you, I, well, uh, other people can easily refer to the moment when uh, in Tiananmen uh, Square, a huge uh, Confucian statue was uh, displayed. But uh, for a, uh, a short period, it didn't withdraw. I mean, this moment could be considered as a very symbolic uh, in testing how people react. Yeah. Did you with John? Yeah, to him, to him back. Yeah. So you know, you know, even the huge statue uh, putting in the square, and then uh, yeah, a kind of gesture that would replace Marxism, and Marx, or, or other other figures, but but it withdraws. Uh, so so it's kind of mysterious whether uh, what happened. Yeah? How how come this did happen? But but it coincided with the movement of establishing those uh, Confucian Institute. Now been very controversial all over the world. Uh, but, um, no more than ten years. Uh, second thing is um, well, it's is um, a a researchable question, but still not yet uh, many concrete finding about uh, what kind of influence of the. Confucian principle have been actually changing uh, the party's policy because you, if you consider it as a, a national, nationwide policy, I don't see that it's very concrete way that you can say apart from the recent uh, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, uh, gesture in the in the 19th con uh, People's Congress. Uh, but I guess in the local level. Regional level that influence of Confucianism is so proliferated. They allow all sorts of these Minjian uh, uh, or civil uh, practices uh, to, to go. I mean, especially in the village level, I mean, it's a huge change back into the old day. <laughs> so, so, so the, the eradication of uh, the uh, influence of uh, Confucius, you people might easily refer to easily associated with the cultural revolution has nothing. It's completely different from now. Um, there are many ways to answer your question. Um, there's a huge comeback right now of anything traditional um, in China um, in, in the uh, uh, intellectual level and also on the government governance level. On the governance level, I would interpret it as actually a survival strategy. Um, there's a huge vacuum of moral values right now, and from from you know all sorts of uh, uh, um, levels, and the, from the government's level, this actually becoming a direct threat um, to to the legitimacy of the administration. So that, uh, after basically the Cultural Revolution, and then um, all the way up to the Tiananmen massacre. Uh, and then changing suddenly to capitalism with you know opening up things, things opening up policy. Right now, all of a lot of the uh, education with Marxism and um, socialist values had went down the toilet. Um, so that kind of left a whole a new hole in terms of morality, in terms of what holds the society together. So basically, there's a a real threat to social stability, a real threat to, you know, why do I have to stay this, in this country and why do we, why, how does this um, party state maintain its legitimacy? So anything traditional, especially Confucianism, is being reinvented, I would say, in order to legitimize that rule because the 
emphasis on hierarchy, for example, um, emphasis on the, um, the family state continuum, a lot of those things actually help the CCP to stay in power, they think, at least, in their version. So that's one way to see it. Um, there's also another, as I you know, mentioned again and again, the recall of the Cold War. Um, that's the Confucian Institute actually was not first, I would say, it, it's not an invention by the CCP, it was an invention of the uh, Guomindang, of the KMT. Um, they have been implementing Center for Chinese Studies, which specifically studied everything before 1949, especially as old as possible, as traditional as possible, because that's where they think their forte is. And Center for Chinese Studies has always been very popular in Europe, in West, Western Europe especially. Um, and, then, and, and so the Confucian Institute is now, is, if you look at the map of the, where they place the Confucian Institute, they particularly actually locate them right next to the Center for Chinese Studies from Taiwan, next to each other in competition. Now, now that China becomes a big power, of course, politically, a lot of those nations you know, invest much more in the Confucian, newly founded Confucian Institute strategically, much more than the Taiwan Center for Chinese Studies. But they are in huge competition. Confucianism, but uh, it was really in the days following the last Congress that there was an editorialist in the Global Times, it, it might have been this Eric Lee, I don't know, um, who had a very interesting uh, commentary, and he was, I guess the, the, the question leading the article was like, how does Marxism, uh, is, is Marxism a foreign idea? Or not, or is, is, is obviously a foreign idea, but uh, what do we do with a foreign idea? And the analogy that uh, uh, helped this dilemma was Buddhism, actually. And his point was that, in the same way in which we were able to take a foreign idea, uh, uh, Buddhism, and to integrate it so masterfully into the fiber of Chinese civilization, in the same way Marxism, which is, yes, indeed a foreign idea, but uh, you know, we can also integrate it masterfully in the in the in, in Chinese civilization. So I thought it was a very beautiful stroke of, a, of, of, of pen, and yeah, very skillful. I have a question for Simon. What change? The the crackling effect that you mentioned. I'm very curious because I know nothing about batik. I no, I'm totally ignorant about batik. So um, I want to ask you. Um, how much of that do you think is maybe influenced by like Song Dynasty ceramics, which also has a crackling technique, which is famous for its crackling technique, like a, like a Kai Pian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To be honest, I don't know if anyone has sort of like done any research in terms of comparing, say, uh, a ceramic ware in relation to, say, the crackling effect on her body. But I think... Um, yeah, it was also very controversial when it was first... That's right. Yeah, as opposed to the ceramic um, yeah. emphasis on integrity. Right. Um, there could be some sort of, like, connection, and the connection could be a sort of, like, coastal, a shared sort of, like, coastal culture. I'm not sure. I haven't sort of, like, looked closely into that. But, be, uh, but it was always sort of like seen traditionally as something that is as, uh, probably in the same sort of like, in the same instance in China as well, as a kind of mistake, right? As an accident. Mm -hmm. It wasn't sort of like yeah. seen as, um, you know, an object of some, uh, it's not an aesthetic device that you consciously try to emulate until it was something that was taken up by, a, you know, another sort of like culture. Uh, was that the same case with Pekin as well? It's kind of a mystery. I don't know if anybody yeah. knows better here, but from what I know, it's, it was basically dug up by It was dug up, you know, from the from the uh, Qinglong uh, Yang Qi. It was like a thousand uh, AD, and then the technique was lost for a long time until it was rediscovered um, how to do it. So um, exactly how it came into being and was. As far as I know, kind of mysterious. But then, but then it was when it was first discovered from the from the um, site, from the archaeological site. It was considered a a a, a shock 
because it upset the, a lot of Chinese conventional historical notions of what ceramics should look like. My sense is probably the crackling technique, um, the regard for, uh, there may be at least a certain sort of aesthetic regard for the crackling technique really sort of came about quite late, even in the 19, from the 19th century sort of like onwards. And primarily I think it has to do with like the machine uh, when uh, they were trying to sort of replicate it, uh, replicating, uh, to replicate sort of like printing of but they like sort of like texture and form to the machine, they weren't able to sort of like perfect it. And that was when it became more and more sort of like prevalent. It felt very different from say if you were to sort of like hand drawn your body. Right? Uh, certain kinds of wax that they use, uh, I think the Javanese court were very particular in collecting uh, these wax from specific sort of like locales across Java. Uh, and you couldn't even sort of like cultivate these sort of like um, the collection of so the bee, farm, uh, bee farms in order for you to collect these wax. It needs to be collected in the wild. Uh, so uh, in order to achieve that sort of like harlowness, um, so that you wouldn't have all these crackling kind of like techniques. So the crackling piece sort of like came much later uh, as to how much it had connection with that particular kind of aesthetic. I could only conjecture as much. It would be good to open it to the public at this point. <laughs> so, are there commentaries uh, in? Um, I just have to make a very quick comment about the tracking on ceramics. It's, uh, I'm a, I work in ceramics, so the, it's actually um, very much about a purpose defect on, on occasion that you manage to control. And as you know, especially as you go towards very complex Qing dynasty ceramics, you um, leave aside all the considerations in search of high technical, um, just being extremely good technically and being capable of controlling something that in other occasions would have been considered a mistake. Um, just, that, just something that I, I also had another question, which is actually for the, all of you, maybe, and it's. How much, if at all, does the difference in the type of colonization matter in decolonization? I think in the case of Hong Kong, for example, we seem to have gone from what was a colony of election to a settler's colony, if we accept the idea that we are again a colony. So we went from being a place to which, um, as, as you said very, very clearly, um, the British were quite happy to let people do whatever they wanted to do, to believe in whatever they wanted to believe, etc. To now being, if we are a colony again, a place where there is this very strong immigration. And you know, the, from the, the colonial power, in a sense, if we accept that as being a colonial power, they being a colonial power. And in, the, in some other instances, the type of colony uh, was by let's say, the Western colonizer, a different way of colonizing. So the way it was colonized in Brazil, the way it was colonized in Singapore and Malaysia, were very different, like, in, in political science parallels, were very different types of colony. How much do these um, affect the decolonization process? And how, is there a kind of parallel between these different types of colony settlers uh, election or just administration or, or resource taking whatever um, and the perversion of it in, in this rise of nationalism I don't know if I'm clear I hope I don't know <laughs> I think we should answer because they discuss so they discuss so so much in the also that in the the yes. Um, um. Okay, my gut reaction, which is probably not the appropriate reaction, but um, I for some reason that's not what I heard from uh, Sangol. Um, 
um, if Sango was saying that um, that the Brits let Hong Kong people do whatever they want in the colonial days, I would entirely disagree with him. In terms of beliefs, um, no, definitely not. I would totally disagree with him. If that's what he's saying, but that's not what I heard. I, I think that he said something else. But <laughs> but uh, if that's what he's saying, I would totally disagree with it. I mean, even um, even in the art art uh, practice context, um, um, in the documentary that I mentioned in Diaz Brown or Dead Air, it's actually online. I put all my works online for free, so you can always go to YouTube and check it out. Um, I actually interviewed a, a seasoned artist from Hong Kong, uh, in Hong Kong, Choi Yan Ji, who talked um, about how he was ju she was just a painter, um, you know, uh, coming out of a uh, 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 teacher's college, applying for a teaching job in a high school in the 80s. And just because he had a connection to a, to a grandfather who was an Indonesian leftist, who went back to China during the Cultural Revolution to support the communist regime, just because of that very, actually pretty remote connection, just because of that, he was, uh, she didn't get any teaching jobs in Hong Kong and from the public school system. And one of the public schools who didn't hire her actually told her that it, it was a demand from the political, um, there's a, uh, what is it called? Um, a department of politics in Hong Kong um, that uh, she was blacklisted, and that's that's actually one of the reasons why she decided to leave Hong Kong to go to the U.S. to Chicago for for study because she couldn't find a teaching job in public school. So I mean, there are tons of these stories, orally, in grassroots, uh, documented tons of these about what the Brits to, done to all kinds of people just because of their beliefs, or even not because of their beliefs, but because of their ancestors' beliefs. I had not ever said that uh, people in Hong Kong can do whatever they do. When I say, uh, my, in my presentation, I'm just saying that uh, they are free to practice their custom and uh, let Chinese identity and ch uh, even Chinese nationalism would not be a taboo in Hong Kong for a long period of time, except, of course, uh, you know, in Cold War and also in wartime, right? The, you know, the, <laughs> I, I, I can't fancy any place that you can, one can really do anything. No, no, I know, but look, okay. I, I mean, I mean, um, uh, you raised a very important question. I, I think uh, the formation of colonial power for me is uh, uh, very uh, across uh, different mode. There wouldn't be uh, unified mode. But I, one, one of the problem about uh, proliferation of these uh, post-colonial discourses may somehow uh, be quite uh, flattening you know, the, the whole uh, complexity of a colonial situation because it, it is very easy to invoke this kind of colonizer and colonizer and now we are no, no longer talking about colonizer and colonizer but uh, imperialist or imperialist or western or the non-western I mean it's somehow related to to post-colonial discourse, but post-colonial discourse be precisely draw our attention to each case specificity, the context, the, the condition. That is what why I um, yeah I, I have no time to skip the methodological part. But I, I prefer not to you repeat the word colonialism because I know no single model of colonialism. But I from from a historiographic point of view, I. Uh, I emphasize the Foucauldian potential notion, uh, notion of, uh, well, we, you need to understand power not just from the so-called negative or repressive point of view, but power as mobile, uh, so that uh, I, 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 I suggest the concept of so-called malleable colonialities that could travel and then be, well, um, employ uh, and deploy or, or what, make it uh, not fixed <coughs> and uh, see the fluidity or the colonial power. <laughs> I have something to say about that, but I don't know if it's a direct response. And it's, it's something that I felt when I went to Brazil after you know, working mostly in Europe. And it's like how you couldn't find there some theories, like, you know, 
Rancière and Badiou were like all over the place in Europe in the 2000s, and I go to Brazil and nobody's read them, and it was like, so good, man. Uh, I mean, it's like something like, I mean, and right now, it seems like in the Fano is coming to Brazil, but there's some people saying, Fano is not going to be useful here. I mean, uh, there's people who are saying, for example, queer, the word queer is not, is not, is not the word to use. We don't want to do that. I think that, and it's interesting to say that, I mean, I think that, that doesn't mean in, in not forcing people, banning things to, from being read. But it's about sometimes things that have been um, confirmed in, in, in Western academia propose themselves as a solution for every problem um, in every part in the world. And sometimes that doesn't work. I think that very often it doesn't work. Um, I mean, there's no, I mean, it's taken to art. I mean, I mean all, this, all, this, all this, you know, critical art theory from October and all this stuff is completely useless, completely useless to understand anything in, in South America. And you know, nobody should waste any minute reading that thing, I think. Uh, Rancière, among these French theorists who may have written interesting political theory for Western Europe, have nothing at all to say about, they don't understand a single thing about South American politics either. And it's not useful, I mean, to read them. I mean, you can read them if you want to, but I mean, if you want to work on that context, I think it's probably better to use, to, to read something else. And I think that, I think that we have to be, wary of, of those importations, I think, uh, importing those kind of things uh, just because they seem to be the reference that has to be made. I think it's, um, I think it's a good exercise to say why, why this text, why this speech, what is there a speech here which is maybe interesting. Or, um, I think that, that that's a nice exercise, I think. Uh, can I also caution again, sort of perhaps uh, foreclosing the possibility that, you know, uh, that reading Rosalind Krauss might be sort of like useful in looking at say, something in Southeast Asia. Uh, I, I don't want to also sort of like foreclose that by saying yeah. that there are sort of... Uh, you, yeah. yeah, but I think that she doesn't need to be defended, yeah. but she's coming with a whole artillery. She has a, a machinery that is, yeah. that is, that is proposing but her. I mean, I'd be also she more interesting all... to sort of think yeah. about, hey, if yeah. that sort of makes sense here, then hey, yeah. uh, that, that could also yeah. be that possibility that, well, not, let's not sort sure. of like foreclose no, sure. that, but sort of... By sort yeah. of like claiming some kind of essentialism. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's just that she comes with just like a Hollywood movie. She already has distribution platforms. You see, she's being sold already, while the other people are not. No? Uh. It, well, it's something that you just said, Simon, but uh, I thought that you were going to react when you heard uh, Pablo's position in relation to queer. But as a uh, a category that is instrumentalized, um, but you used to reply with <laughs> Ross in Christ. <laughs> <Example. laughs> you know, very true. But now yeah. that you have time, I can't imagine how I can use her, but I don't want to foreclose that possibility. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, maybe coming back to your presentation, I, I just wanted to understand a little bit more when you started to uh, speak about the great aesthetic representation in the homoerotic and... Oh, you mean at the end? Yeah. Uh, uh, were you... Uh, maybe we can just hear clearly for me, but was it understanding that Greco-Roman representation was also a colonial uh, foreign language? Uh, like, let's say, the language yeah. architecture of the palace yeah. in... Well, I don't know if you sort of viewed it as necessarily colonial. He was a poet. I imagine someone like Patrick Byrne to be a poet. He would consider himself a citizen of the world and therefore was able to sort of like use recode all these sort of like languages and various sort of like language facilities, visual language facilities that were made available to him in that particular context and time in order to sort of fashion something uh, that would to his sort of like experience of a kind of intimacy, right? That he wanted to sort of like uh, produce through making these sort of like birthday paintings with homosocial sort of like themes. I don't necessarily see them as colonial. Uh, and I wonder if it is useful to them again 
to sort of foreclose the discussion by saying that by saying that this is definitely sort of like a colonial sort of mode of production just because uh, a, 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 a colonial visual language just because it came from uh, Europe. And then yeah. you really then continue to then reinforce that sort of like East West kind of like binary that it never for me never really that productive in actually looking at what is happening in the world. At least that is my how I view things so. okay, the last thing. I'm just curious like what are there what is like the are there current discussions not only in Malaysia but should have not been in that Islam is also seen as colonial in, in certain regards? Uh, I guess India is very, very common, very right? I think in JNU, they just recently passed a course called Islamic Terrorism. Mm -hmm. and I, think would, I imagine how a course like that would allow for some form of historicization that would bring in the whole kind of reading of Islam as a form of Mughal invasion uh, that you would sort of connect. Uh, the current sort of like violence to if it's to an imagined sort of like long degree history of sort of like Islamic violence against sort of like Hindu and activism. But in Burma it's very much Burma, yeah. specifically as a colonial uh, as a colonial force and it it uses the example of uh, well, Indonesia and Malaysia so, uh, that have already been colonized as the as the Sort of like reference in, in in the discourse against the colonial forces of Islam in Myanmar, where well, they're five percent of the population. Um, so yeah, in that construct from the side of, of, of Myanmar, there's yeah, like Indonesia and Malaysia are seen as, as colonized parts of the sort of like Buddhist, Hindu, uh, Southeast Asia, wherever Islam has won. And I think, for example, I may say in Tibetan sort of like a particular Sand Mandala called the Chalachakra, uh, Chalachakra Sand Mandala. It is written into its cosmology and mythology that the end of time is brought about by an invasion of the Islam. So it's a very specific kind of like esoteric Tibetan practice that had that mythology to it. May I make a short comment? Um, um, thinking uh, uh, listening to what uh, you are saying and thinking about it, I had an idea that the current, at least where I live uh, currently in Western Europe, uh, their general obsession with the word decolonizing, this is what is happening, yes, in art institution, like everything has to be decolonized and as urgently as possible, and we museums and everything, like we immediately have to decolonize, nobody really understands what that would mean. Uh, and that probably uh, has something to do with uh, this um, very Western and maybe very neoliberal, you know, uh, privileging of freedom over anything else. So it's like the colonizing means like everybody and every ethnicity, uh, every people, every, uh, every person maybe even uh, have to uh, acquire this sort of freedom, which is sounds, if we think about it, sounds very utopian and uh, you know, kind of a mess. And I was interested, of course, uh, listening to what Pablo was saying, although this is something like very, very far away from my experience, and uh, uh, you know, that really hearing those details for the first time from someone who knows uh, this life. I was uh, I was astonished how you applied very different criteria actually. So that uh, you were talking about how uh, can this living together actually happen of uh, different totally different ways of life? How it is a, it actually possible? Uh, but it requires several things that might be maybe not decolonizing something else, like not necessarily. At least, like listening to you, I kind of strangely looked at this notion of decolonizing of something very Western obsession of about about this like giving freedom to everybody while there might be some other criteria applied. It's just a short note. I'm, I'm sorry if I um, stood that uh, super quickly. Um, I mean, the, you know, the, 
There's something about uh, this, this theory thing. I think that the West is super good at ex exporting problems and exporting solutions and making itself the center. This this book by um, the French guy, um, we've always been modern. What is it, this guy? This French guy, Natu. It's, I mean, it, it, it makes the whole problem of colonization into a psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis of the West, and it's like, Jesus Christ, I mean, leave us alone, I mean, everything becomes about you, you know? But you don't usually have to deal with us as like passive receivers. Do no, I mean, there's no, there's no passive receiver, but you can say, I don't want to receive this shit, yeah. you know? Well, but but, it, but these things are exported. And we transform because, it to something else. Yeah, because the, the people who, who translate the books in Brazil are white people who admire theoretical production from France. I mean, because there's also colonial unconscious within every country that has been a colony. Yeah. The colonial unconscious is a structure that, you know, people from the colonized countries have within themselves, you know? So Ali Raoniki talks about this. Um, and, you know, and that means that, you know, we receive and we admire and, you know, look at that, what this guy is saying in Harvard, it's amazing. I mean, the, the other day there was this famous, no, fam interesting curator from Argentina who got a job at MoMA, and everybody in, the face, in my Facebook was saying, amazing, and it's like, Jesus Christ, I mean, the, 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 oh, the goal of every Latin American curator is to get a job at MoMA? Jesus Christ, I mean, this is so sad. I mean, so these aspirations are also so strange, and you know, um, I think, um, I mean, it's, I don't know, so, it's, so you improve what visitors to MoMA, you know, see about Latin American art, whatever. But I think that I think that you know this, this thing that we said before about their conditioning. When you can't get rid of the colonial structure and history, is there. So I think that you know you have to live with it in a constant conflict. I mean, the people I know, I mean, indigenous people, they talk about this conflict. I mean, and the, the most interesting positions are of those the most the ones I've learned the most is of those who live in the village and grew up in the village, indigenous village, but they also you know, work outside because they have to or because they want to call it, but they constantly go back and forth. And they keep the, the back and forth. Like Elvira Spejo, who is an amazing artist, she's also the, the head of the folklore museum in La Paz. She's Aymara, she comes from a village. Her whole construction of life, political and cultural, is about how to kind of create this, 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 this dialogue in complete conflict, because there's no way to concili conciliate, reconcile these two places, but it's, but this, you know, she can't, you know, destroy the museum and destroy the city of La Paz and destroy, you know, this, this, this negotiation which is always super difficult all the time, but, you know, that's what life is somehow, and that's a nice approach to it, I think. So, um, I was actually wondering if um could hear from the two conveners, so from Katharina and from Husman about, you know, having now, I mean, I think at the start of the weekend, there was a kind of a description of what in the discussion was meant to be, and then now that you've heard from all the, um, from the speakers, presenters, if you have you know, comments about that. So that's one thing, is, you know, just kind of your impression. And then the second thing is that Pablo, you know, talked about the kind of the way the curators coming to Brazil and kind of you know discovering the ind discovering the indigenous in some ways and trying to present that, and um, that made me think of you know the recent kind of um, larger biennials and their attempts to do that, um, for instance in Venice or in Documenta, um, disastrously in some cases, and um, it Good you chance. know. Hmm? <laughs> um, but you know, we're, it's also I think not entirely accidental that this is happening at the on the last day of your exhibition, right? Which is in some ways kind of trying to come to terms with a certain kind of history and kind of has also proposed a certain way of kind of dealing with that history. And maybe one way of doing it is to precisely not to ahistoricize it, not to present the shaman as a kind of this category that exists, but as some as situated within a very very precise historical context, right? And so I was wondering if you could also, if people might have some comments about kind of, you know, from a curatorial perspective, like what to, how to deal with that. I, yeah, uh, I actually started, you know, precisely that, you know, referring to what um, Pablo said. So, uh, so one of their impressions with which I'm coming out of this uh, very intense and interesting meeting is how, how actually uh, relative 
all those notions are this decolonizing, for instance, can be understood uh, very differently, or sometimes this is not what we not what is needed actually. So this is a there is a cluster of issues uh, dealing with uh, different global inequalities rooted in different things, and we have to look at them before actually applying this universal rule that everything has to be immediately decolonized, like. Uh, like it used to be post-colonial, like just, just recently. Uh, but um, mostly I wanted indeed to return to the exhibition and to answer uh, my own question, which I asked in our internal meeting. I now have an answer to, to that. Uh, so the question was um, also to Pablo. Uh, we were discussing uh, how those um, international structures of contemporary art uh, might be uh, not needed or even not able to accommodate uh, all the variety of uh, art if we truly, uh, if we would be truly inclusive, if we would be uh, truly include uh, not just um, artists, modernist artists, uh, who postmodern artists who studied at Goldsmith or would like to study in Goldsmith, <laughs> you know, kind of, not just them, but also others. and. Um, I, I asked uh, at our conversation, I asked uh, myself uh, and my colleagues, so what would that mean? Because I'm, as an art historian, of course, raised uh, and educated in this paradigm of uh, international avant-garde, and this is how I explain art, this is how I understand in principle art. It can be, uh, it can include some other things as well. Uh, but still, if we if we start to include artists who are not in this paradigm at all, let's say indigenous artists, then I don't. I said in my question, I said that I don't know which narrative then to apply. Then should we apply uh, a totally relative, relativist uh, relativist uh, paradigm like this is a uh, this is an expression different expression of universal human. Um, creative spirit, you know, something like that. So that would be very boring for me personally, and this is why I that would like um, any meaning of art would uh, disappear, so I had my doubts. But after I attentively, you know, looked at the exhibition, which is Cosman is presenting here, I uh, realized that this is, there is of course another answer, because this is precisely the type of exhibition that includes also indigenous artists and artists that are working with uh, that material and very sophisticated artists who studied in Goldsmith or would like to study in Goldsmith. <laughs> uh, and it all comes together uh, totally meaningfully. Uh, and why? What would it be the narrative then? The narrative then uh, would be about um, human history and human conditions of life in different places on our earth and each artist is telling, in one or another way, is artist. Each artist is telling a story about something very concrete. So in that sense, it's history. There are many historical uh, references here, uh, and it is some sort of a museum of contemporary art, which goes strongly in the direction of the museum of the human condition of human history, and that uh, is for me the place where any artist could, could find. Uh, it his or her place, and that gives me hope that uh, the truly, truly inclusive uh, art projects are actually possible. This is why I really, really want to congratulate Cosmin with this great exhibition and the whole team of Paradise. We're not going to end this. No, at all. <laughs> 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 and I, yeah, it's, but maybe I mean th well, thank you also for the answer. I don't know if I should necessarily like add anything to to John, but there's like two more questions. Should we have these two questions really quickly, better and rather than yeah? So I think it was you and then Michelle. Um, can I no. No. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, well, maybe it's more like common than a question, but um, the first thing about. The, the the kind of obsession of the the colonial in the Western Europe because I'm actually living and working in the Netherlands and actually there are the the col colonized people living in this country and then somehow the Netherlands still presenting itself as innocent so we still need to deal with this problem with 
yeah, they are present, they're living, and they're kind of discriminated in a more less obvious way. But somehow, these kind of discussion are happening in the academia or our institution, which have certain kind of threshold for common people to understand this cause. So this kind of problem also exists. And in terms of this kind of Chinese neocolonialism, it's kind of, you know, used to motivate this kind of one bell one road project as well. Like uh, this kind of like this Asian civilizations, Asian and also well behind it is this very strong economic impulse and agenda. So I think this kind of colonialism is more complex than just using Confucianism. Um, also, I think, well, the other thing about the indigenous art, because I was visiting the Van Arbor Museum, um, which, were, which is presenting the show called Trademarkings. So they also include works from this Aboriginal um, film collective, Caribbean. So they actually present something about different cosmopolitan cosmology and also ways of connecting with materials and with the world, with the land and with people. So actually I think um, maybe we should develop certain kinds of discourse in order to, to understand their works rather than using the existing discourse to try to, you know, understand them in our own terms. And for Paolo, I actually have a question about, well, you mentioned something about purity and authenticity of some groups of original people. So do they really require this or somehow is uh, like, are they kind of influenced <coughs> by the whites and then they choose to keep themselves pure or something that the whites think that they should keep pure? Because it imposes a kind of existentialism or uncontaminated, Purity, I don't know, because it's some something like the modernity is, you know, the other side of this kind of originality. Let's say, yeah, maybe I'm taking too much space for it. So first, I think I mean there's many different people who have many different positions. No? Uh, and, uh, but I think things are normally said in, re in reaction to something. Um, so I think that some of the need to essentialize what is indigenous comes from the fact that indigenous populations are being, you know, for 500 years decimated and told that being indigenous is not good. So if you, if, you know, in, as a reaction against that, you, you have to define some parameters and, and this, those parameters may have to be simplified according to the context where you're speaking. And this, you know, discourse has effects of, you know, incorporations and stuff. And I mean, the theorization of indigenous identities in the Amazon done by, you know, academics, white academics and French and Brazilian mostly. Um, but, you know, they also take on the discourse of indigenous uh, people without saying it until now. but. Uh, but somebody like Viveros de Castro or, or Clast, uh, French, uh, 60, 70, would talk about um, the specificity of indigenous, Amazonian indigenous people as uh, being something that they read through the Lesian philosophy, right? But what they read, I mean, I think that there was an attempt at understanding a way of constructing identity which is completely fluid and based on difference. So the only way they had to frame it academically was to use the less as a, as a lens, which is maybe, is the same thing as using Kant as a lens, but it's maybe more interesting in the sense that it allows for a different way of articulation. So it's, it's really, it's really per this perverse, I mean, but at the end, you know, the most famous anthropologist in Brazil right now, which is super famous everywhere, Viveros de Castro, is becoming like a darling of international, I don't know if he's a god here, but he's a Delesian, and he's imposed a Delesian perspective on indigenous people, but when you read now some indigenous people are writing, and the writing of indigenous people is, you realize that he also paraphrased them without quoting them. 
because you don't quote in this, you know, speak Pearson, but you quote the less. It's all really just it's so weird. And this guy spent a year with them when he was doing the thesis, and then spent the rest 30 years making a career of that. Of that one year, he spent listening to some indigenous people in the village, and then and then reading it through the letters in order to give it a tint or something. But I think that there's a lot of, uh, I mean, it, uh, but it, in my experience, uh, there is uh, recuperation of certain traits of what indigenous means, which may refer to an ident identitarian issue. But fluidity and change is very much part of it all the time. You become something all the time. You become plant, you become beast, you become, and, but these processes are very different in each of them. But you, you don't remain. I mean, they are not ecstatic. Any of, none of them are ecstatic. It's, that's super interesting. That's what makes it, and that's why we was made them survive. Uh, this adaptability. I mean, you, you become something else, but you keep something at the same time. It's, it's, it's super interesting that. But, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because it really, really like uh, over time now. So. For um, close your your book and um, your presentation is very much focused on the Hong Kong Chinese. So to put a very it can be a very long question, but I will make it very brief. It's where do you think that space of the non Chinese? in the Hong Kong community is. I mean, Hong Kong has multiple generations where uh, of ethnically non-Chinese people have lived and have been treated in very in unequal terms in terms of uh, education, um, access to resources and all that. And uh, I just wonder what you think if there is a meaningful relationship with Hong Kong's coloniality and possible decolonization, where is the space? and the place of people who are of non-Chinese ethnicity. Well, uh, you are something that I uh, rarely know anything about. Uh, the how, But but the uh, non-Chinese uh, figures quite prominently in the whole coloniality of uh, Hong Kong. But uh, I, I haven't done any, any research on that, so I can answer. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to respond to Actually, when, when I was walking through the Hong Kong side of the umbrella movement with Wu Bing, actually from Singapore, he asked we are the minorities, say, right? yeah, we are the other people. We, yeah, we always only, we often only see the Chinese ethnic uh, group in the, right, but not in the occupied movement. Yeah, but then, yeah, there were actually still a few, but comparative, comparatively, mainly, the uh, that's also actually, a problem. There were, there were even like organized as a group, they were, um, like, there was like a group of uh, Filipino domestic workers. Um, who demonstrated as a group? There was a, a group of people from Pakistan and Bangladesh. I, um, yeah, I, I even have like, I, I talked with some of them, and, and and I mean, this is actually like uh, communities coming as groups and with signs that were speaking, you know, from the perspective of a, of a group. So, but this was in the first two three days, I think. Then things started to change, I think, in many ways. Yes, and then I think the temporary, the temporary nature of the Occupy site, uh, of the umbrella movement, also has something to do with the really exclusiveness of what we think that we, because the major slogan from in the umbrella movement is like I want, I want the true um, universal suffrage. So and then, but the, this identity of I, who is it, is really ambiguous, and this is also one of the reasons of, yeah. The, the, um, but uh, like it or not, uh, 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 like uh, what we are when we are talking about localism, as uh, well, some some or most of us would uh, have a reservation about. But uh, I guess uh, it changed a bit about the self-definition of Hong Kong, uh, not just uh, considered as uh, belonging to China. Naturally, you know the whole 
uh, local is trying to define that uh, yeah Hong Kong is not China uh, therefore we have to define Hong Kong and that we have to got all the elements that can help them to redefine what Hong Kong means and, and also try to uh, well like um, retrieve those uh, sources any kind of sources like uh, you go to uh, pay tribute to um, uh, the soldier that died in uh, the World War II, uh, because they defend Hong Kong and so forth. Right? I think in that respect, uh, these localists uh, has pushed for, at least uh, they have they create a certain effect on the young generation that uh, Hong Kong is something that needs to be redefined. So, so things are not so <laughs> one-dimensional. To cut a long story short, I well, I um, I obviously disagree <laughs> with Sung in many ways, and um, I, I, and I was basically trying to say in my presentation that I think um, for Hong Kong to even start to think of itself as having any decolonizing possibility, um, it this society will have to reposition itself vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, and find itself um, a position in the Chinese scheme of things. Um, so that question I would actually rephrase as, so how would the ethnic minorities of Hong Kong see themselves as fitting into this Chinese scheme of things in the long run? Now I would, I would hope, I would, I would tr um, try to see it in a more hopeful manner. There are many possibilities, but as far as things go right now in China, there's a lot of um, 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 a lot of desire, as far as we can see from the policy level, um, to attract um, um, people, especially people of color, from all around the world, in order to work to work in China, um, and um, um, as long as you you learn the language, learn the Chinese. So there are all kinds of soap operas, all kinds of competitions. Um, uh, in the popular culture level about that. So that's one way to think about it. Well, thank you so much, everyone, uh, to you for staying so long and for all of you to have contributed today and actually over the last two days, I think. Uh, it was very interesting for us and I hope it was very interesting for you as well. And, and yeah, thank you again to everyone.